Unlike most of the cars that arrive at the shop, when Kimberly Cook's 1970 Barracuda showed up, it was running and driving. Join us as Mark and the Ghouls tear it down, document everything, restore, repair, rebuild, and completely resurrect this beautiful 383 convertible. A car like this may not be worth millions to collectors, but to the cooks, it's priceless. Get ready for one of the most heartwarming and emotional reveals in graveyard history. A little over two years ago, I got a phone call from Tommy Cook, his wife, Kimberly was there with him when they made the call. They shared with me the story about the car, uh, about how it had belonged to her father and that he had passed away and that they were interested in getting some restoration work done. There they are. Hi, Kimberly. Yes. Mark, nice Hi. to meet you. Kimberly and Tommy are just an adorable couple. They're really cool people. Um, they live in Alabama, big, big time sports fans, uh, love their Mopars. Ultimately though, at the end of the day, I had a good feeling that I had made the right decision on bringing the car in after I had met them. I mean, I always knew that, but sometimes the people show up and you go, I, I would rather, Tom Partridge, for example, is a great, great example of that. But, uh, but these guys are really cool and it was nice to meet them. So after they showed up, we had a chance to go around, uh, show them the shop and they were sharing some of the stories that uh, of the car and the memories and the things that they remember about their father associated with the car. Well, this car is oh, <laughs> extremely special to my wife. My dad bought the Barracuda in 1978, two years before I was even born. And I spent my childhood in the car, especially in the summertime. My dad coached my t-ball and softball teams and we went everywhere in it um, with my dad and my sister and just grew up in the car. Well, in 1995, when my sister was killed in a car accident, my dad just kind of hung the key up and didn't drive it anymore. It was like it wasn't enjoyable to him. Um, didn't drive it for several years. And then in the early 2000s, he wanted to get it, start getting it restored, but the money just wasn't there. Um, he was laid off work twice. He was helping me go through college, and the finances just weren't there. And then in um, October of... 2009, my dad was diagnosed with stage four prostate cancer. And they only gave us a couple years for him to live. So didn't think much of the Barracuda even then and noticed him getting sicker and sicker and decided that we had to get the car at least drivable for him before he passed away. So about a couple months before he passed away, we took it and got it running, got the motor, you know, worked on. And he couldn't drive it at that point in time because his illness had gotten so bad. But um, he could still go for a ride in it. And the look on his face when he saw it running was just worth every bit of it. And it was just so great to see him see his baby driving again. And so he got to, he got to go for a couple rides in it before he passed away. It's one year to the day that uh, he has, since he's passed away, and I and, uh, find it fitting that his, his baby is in, the, in your shop awaiting its restoration. After walking around the shop and seeing all the cars that Mark works on, I just, I feel like he's here with us. I feel, I can feel my dad with us. You know, I know that he's here. Yeah, I think the car is going to look, look amazing when it's finished. Your dad would be proud of it. Yeah. We had their car raised up in the air so we could talk about some of the things that I had seen the other day when it showed up. See these pockets right here? This right. piece right here? They added this for it being convertible. And so when people go out and they make convertibles out of cars that aren't real convertibles and they don't know that goes there, uh, I just look underneath there and say that car. Well, the VIN will tell you too, right, but right. if you had a CUDA that was just a regular hardtop CUDA, okay. but with a 440 or bigger, it got them too. Uh, so the, the main thing was those cars will twist under extreme torque or if you take the roof away. Yeah. So I like to educate my clients as to what to expect. And in the case of their 70 Barracuda uh, L code, 382 barrel convertible, I told them it'll look exactly the way it did when it was on the assembly line in 1970. I'll do that. That's my job. Hey, Ro, at least one good thing about it, your hair's not getting messed up. You know? I know I put on this bravado that, that I just can't wait to make somebody miserable, but the guys were wanting so bad to go for a ride in the convertible, and I thought about it. I figured, well, what's it going to really hurt, right? A little bit of gas go around the block a couple of times. So, you know, out of the kindness of my stupid old heart, I decided, what the heck, let's, uh, let's give them a ride. Unfortunately, I didn't trust them to drive the car, so I put them on the back of the rollback in the convertible, but the effect was the same. This is stupid. Like, thank you, Royal, for this. 
Now, you're the one that wanted to drive the car. Well, the ca oh, no, I know these people right here. Hi, Randy. I think that there's an emotional connection in all the cars. The people wouldn't send them to me. They wouldn't invest the money in them if they didn't mean something to them somewhere. Maybe it means more because her father had bought it when it was nearly new and she had grown up in it and there's all the wonderful pictures of her next to it and working on having her dandy a, a, a wrench and stuff like that. I think that the care and the concern and the, the exercise of patience on her car is really the same as it would be on any other car. All of them require the same amount of quality attention to detail, both disassembling it as well as reassembling it. You see how it's hanging over the edge that way? Right. And it's centered. I've got them out back that most of them are way over here, but this particular one is almost centered and over that way. I want to duplicate that when we go back together again. Okay. You know, 30 years ago, guys like Dave Weiss didn't have books out. Okay, you can go to mmcdetroit.com and you can buy books that tell you how the assembly line markings were and where the decals went. But again, these are reference photos from other cars. When I'm putting the car back together, I want to put it together the way it came apart, the way that when that hood got lifted up, and Mr. Pitts would look inside there, the things that he saw should be the things that the, we see today, exact location of the ethylene glycol warning label, exactly the finish on this or, or where that was placed on there, the emission labels. Things like that, they're preserving the heritage of the car. And would they make any difference and would anybody except the guy that took it apart know? Probably not. But I have my own checks and balance system, so I I'm, hold my own hand to the fire and say that if that's the way it came apart, it's important that that's the way it goes back together again. That's why the, the extra care and the extra concern and the extra documentation when I already have 20 cars that I've taken apart just like it. When these cars start getting blown apart, we basically have a formula in place where we'll leave the front K member together. That'll have all the suspension on upper and lower control arms, upper and lower ball joints, inner and outer tie rod ends, the drag link, steering gear, sway bar, strut rods, all that stuff stays together. So that way we don't have to completely blow it apart and then figure out how it goes back together or detail the markings. When we're ready to do that suspension, rebuild it, we can leave it together right up to that point. Document, document, document with photos, write everything down that we need to write, blow it apart, detail the items, put it back, look at the photo, done. Um, that's how we keep track of things up until the moment where the cars are ready to actually go back together again or ready to be detailed. Because if you did, there's probably 15,000 parts that make up one of these cars. And I think it would be a lot more taxing on us as restoration technicians to try to do that at 15,000 parts at one time than components. We kind of compartmentalize everything we do. Once we got the car to a point where really there was just some stuff left on it under the hood, um, some bracketry, some firewall stuff, seats, things like that, I turned it all over to Derek and Lucky who are competent, good body men. They're hard working guys. They know how important it is to preserve the pieces that are coming off. So uh, that way they could get going on that and we could take the well-deserved lunch break because uh, I was hungry, you know. I got, a, uh, I got an eating disorder, all right? That makes you happy. The case of the convertible top being out in the dirt is one of the biggest slap in the faces to a guy like me. I mean, I work so hard to preserve the things that come off of these cars for sometimes years at a time. I mean, it's a convertible top. Why is What's it that? doing that? See, in his mind, since we're gonna recondition it, it doesn't matter. He never uh, heard the term preserve the integrity, preserve the integrity. When you're in the collision business, you have a responsibility. Is it back there? Son of a. Why does it take two of you to get it out of there when Josh put it back there by himself? To find out that somebody can't follow the basic instructions of putting the parts in a pot. I don't care if you don't have time to put them on a shelf. Just get them in out of the weather. You know, I, I'm quick to jump the gun sometimes, and you know, Derek does, Derek does a great job. I guess Derek was the one that put it out there. He probably had a reason. He might have been seasoning the metal, you know? You, know, you shouldn't jump to conclusions. That's the point. Judge a book by its cover. Royal and Darren did a great job taking the top apart. They're really, I, they handed me back my camera and it was like 150 photographs, which is awesome. Because those are the things that you're gonna need when you go back together, especially being this is a mechanical top and not a power top. So there are things that are unique to it. And I don't have another manual convertible top in the whole place. So they really did. Once we got over the hurdle of finding the part 
and getting it over there, the disassembly went well and the inventory and the parts went well. So that's a, that's a nice thing to have off of our uh, plate so we can start getting the parts clean and ready for reassembly. The disassembly of the car went fairly smoothly. Again, a lot of parts on are a lot more than usual. These cars usually come in as skeletons. So with this being a complete runner driver and working on a bit of a budget, we were gonna reuse some of the critical things in there. For example, the engine had been rebuilt, so we didn't wanna just take the engine out and set it out back. We wanted to preserve the integrity of the parts that were coming off. So a bit more uh, caution and a, and a bit more care was used in the disassembly, inventory, and storage of the parts off this car. But at the end of the day, it came apart nicely and it's now ready to go up to the dipper. So right now I'm assembling the rear leaf springs for Cook 70 Barracuda. They're all powder coated, so all we have to do is put our little slips on here so everything will function properly, nice and quiet. This is our center spacer, which is basically galvanized tin, and they go in the center between each spring so that we have no metal-to-metal -metal contact when everything is bolted together. Okay, this is our rear shackle. It goes through the rear of the spring. This is part right here that goes through the uh, rear frame rail that attaches everything to the car. And that's designed to move so that it allows the rear suspension to travel. So this one's done, I'll go ahead and I'll do the next one and then I'll roll it over to the housing and we'll get her bolted up and put her underneath the car. So I gotta set the third member on here, bolt it up and then press a couple bearings on and put the axles in and then get the brakes done. My favorite rear axle to work on is the eight and three quarter Mopar, it's so simple. You've got a third member carrier, you bolt it into the housing, it's got the sure grip and the gears, everything's in it. You slide the left axle in, you slide the right axle in, you bolt them down, and all of a sudden you've got a, a rear end assembly. It's a very nice system, it's bulletproof. You finish putting your leaf springs on it, detail it out, and you're ready to bolt it in the car. And that's about it. Tighten everything up over there, and we are uh, ready to do brakes. The Cook's Barracuda is patiently waiting on the shop to be restored. The deadline, the delivery date is getting closer each and every day. Look at the, look at here the, get that just right. You can see them, it won't come out either. You see that? Yeah. We have several QC checkpoints throughout the build of a car. This isn't used car work. This is top-notch quality restoration work. So. I want to make sure everything is aligned and ready to go together so we can start putting the trim, ornamentation, top, interior, motor, and transmission in that. The car is actually a very beautiful green. It's the F8 green. It's got a gorgeous look to it. Uh, currently, we have all the body and paint work done, all the fit and all the finish. Everything is ready for assembly. We've got the engine over at the machine shop getting the final machine work done so I can assemble it here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, we're trying for late spring to be able to have this car back to the cooks. Nice. Nice. Okay, when you go to put that on, you usually gotta give it, like these get a little bit banged up. Okay. Because they're just tin. Right. So try to get that to, if you need to force it on there, you can do that. Just like that. These are the special long nuts, the sleeve nuts they call them. See there's threads in there because these manifolds have a hole in them. Here you see the manifold's exposed, you just put a nut on it. But back here, if you want to try to put a nut on it, how are you ever gonna get a socket on it? You're not, so you have to put this in there. Up until just a few years ago, it was really hard to find those, but now Chrysler, amongst a bunch of other people, are reproducing them. That's a factory Mopar deal there. Now, the original ones, at least on the ones that come off most of these, did not have these threaded holes in them. Now, just remember, you wanna do this, you wanna straighten these back out once you get the manifold on, or you'll have a hell of a time putting your, uh, plug wires on, right? We, miraculously, will be ready to roll it in the booth and paint it. Chrysler Corporate Blue. Let's roll it in there, monkey. Oh, oh. I've been painting cars for 25, 30 years. That means everything. That means not only blocking the cars and getting them ready and making sure that they're massaged to perfection, but actually laying that paint out, laying the base coat, laying the clear, laying the single stage out. I'm not the least bit concerned about messing up a paint job because painting is what I do. Yeah, I like to have fun. Everybody knows, anybody seen the show knows I like to have fun. I'm happy, I dance, 
When I'm painting, I like to fool around a little bit. It's just some kind of uh, early martial arts stuff I taught myself in the paint booth. Normally speaking, I did it without the air hose hooked to it, you know, do a double flip, a two and a half time over the back, kind of like a nunchuck type thing. If I'm doing a 50% overlap on a panel, I have no problem with my skill set to do the 50% overlap, come off the end, do a two and a half gainer, flip it, catch it by the lid, put it back in my hand, pull the trigger and come back with a perfect 50% pass. And when I walk away, it looks like God paint. So, can't say the God thing because that's, uh, I think that's a little blasphemous. So I would probably change it from God to more like um, Heavenly Choir of Angels, maybe painted it. But uh, you have one, start cutting the plastic off of them. We got the exhaust system installed in the Barracuda. Uh, again, this is a dual exhaust system that would be standard on a 383 four barrel or a Magnum engine or the same as a 440. That system's the same, but we are putting it on a 383 two barrel. Just remember that the exhaust manifolds on a 383 two barrel are still the HP, even from the factory. I, I do as I'm told, and you know, obviously if Mark says that I don't, I he made me go and take these off of Darren's well, car. Well. What it is is the manufacturer that Tom uses that makes these hangers, they're plant burned down. So he doesn't have any of these. We didn't have any good used ones. And then I got to thinking, Darren's car had them on because Tom gave him the exhaust system for his car. So we just went over and got these off of his car, which I'm sure he'll be fine with it. If you remember when we first brought this car in, it's 383 two barrels, an L code. It was a single exhaust car. So installing the head pipe, the mufflers, the resonators, the hangers, the brackets, all of that stuff uh, is exactly the way it would be if it was a 383 HP. It just happens to be going on a 383 two barrel. Not a lot of things got changed to be able to do this, but I think that cosmetically, aesthetically, and, and just for morale, I, I think it really went a long way. I think she's really, truly gonna love the look and the sound. This needs to go down through the floor of the trunk. If you look over here at this uh, Tawny Gold car, a factory dual exhaust, because this is a V-Code 1971 446 spec four-speed Dana Super Track Pack car. This provision right here is the one that there's going to be a recess up there for it, but these holes won't be there because it never needed them with a 383 two-barrel. So he's just now hanging the bracket. We've already got the resonators in place. As soon as we're done with that, we can put the tailpipes on. The Little Barracuda's journey has been a long one for sure. Um, it's been here just a little under two years and it came in as an original survivor type of car that needed a lot of work to a better than factory car where it's at now. It's really at the last stages of anything. It's getting the visor tips put on it, the hangers for the visors, the mirror pieces, some of just the little things that are left. Uh, Trifer's putting in the windshield to it, who's the only guys in town I trust to do our glass work. They always do a phenomenal job and they took care of it. That's what good quality is. Once that windshield's in and the rest of the trinkets are on it, this car is really getting dangerously close to being done. We're just doing the final wrap up on uh, Kimberly Cook's car, which is installing like the console, uh, the shifter. We got the road lamps going on, bumpers, trim ornamentation, uh, seats. Uh, as soon as that's done, we're gonna be out of the woods on it. I didn't know any better, I'd say that was looking like a car. We got the seats bolted in, tightened down. The final right adjustment height with the torsion bars is set and we are now ready for the grand reveal of the most beautiful 1970 Plymouth Barracuda 383 two barrel manual convertible top EF8 green that the world has ever known, seen, or will see again. You're welcome. Well, this is it. This is our D-Day for Graveyard Cars. Uh, Kimberly and Tommy are waiting outside. You don't look nervous at all. <laughs> Come on down, guys. We're ready for you. How you doing? Good, We're how great. are you? How are you, Mark? Oh, man. I'm Been about as for excited this day as you for guys a long time. <laughs> OK, walk on in here. We got the lights out. Just walk forward a couple of feet. I'll tell you where we're going to be hanging out at. Are you ready now? <sighs> are you sure? Yeah. 
Yeah. Hit it. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm speechless. Oh, oh my god. god. I'm so Unbelievable. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad we could do it. I'm speechless. <laughs> it's gorgeous. It was very touching whenever they first came out and Kimberly just lost it. She started crying. This was the moment that they've been waiting for, you know, and then to see her reaction, it was priceless. I don't know why we strayed from having it all original like we started with, you know, with the hood and the exhaust, but I'm okay with that now. It's literally as close to brand new assembly line as it could be. The only thing I didn't do was I didn't replace the steering wheel because this is the one that your dad had and had his hands on and you probably as a little girl in there playing. Yeah. So I wanted to, to present you with the original wheel and I've got three little nuts here to put it on with and a ratchet. And we got you the famous dice to hang from Tennessee the mirror. Tennessee dice. So if you want, we can put those on, and you can finish checking the whole thing out. And I'll bet after that, you could even get talked into a ride. I can't wait to drive it. Can't wait to get in it, top down. Beautiful day out. Wow. Yep. First crank. Give it some. Oh, wow. <laughs> can't wait. From the very first time that I talked with the cooks on the phone to when we met them uh, and to the meetings in between and the other calls that we've had, I've always known that restoring their car was the right thing to do. And never was there a time that it was more obvious to me than seeing the car done, seeing the reaction, seeing that Graveyard Cars has done something that I think is um, a, only a few people in the world are doing. We're not just restoring cars, but we're restoring and reliving dreams and memories. And so when you put all those together, I am honored to be a part of that journey as well as I am all of the journeys that we've been on at Graveyard Cars. It drove great. It drove like a brand new car. The last time I drove it, it sounded like it was about to fall up to pieces because everything was loose on it. It's kind of like we're at a dealership test driving a new car. Way better than I ever could imagine it would. The car turned out beautiful. It looked really good in the shop, but nothing like it looked when we took it outside in the sun. And I'm not just saying that because it's my favorite color. The sun, just really the natural lights, just bring out all the colors of the paint. The finished product of the car right now, oh my god, it's such a, it's like a 180. The thing looks amazing. It's pretty much a one-of-one -one car. That it's a big block and it only has a two-barrel carburetor. And on top of that, it's an air conditioning car, being a convertible. You didn't see a lot of that. My favorite part about the car is probably her story about her and her dad and everyone. It's part of the family. It's been part of the family since 1977. So I think it'll continue to be a big part of the family now. Mark brought the car back to life and I'm sure my dad has a huge smile on his face and loves seeing it the way it is. Moments like that and the ability to be able to return a, a car like that back and fulfill a dream is what makes what we do worth what we do. That's an extension of, of her father for her. And so, so much more important in those situations for us to do it perfect and do it as good as we can. No matter what happens, where our roads all take us, we'll always have this one thing that bonds us together as friends and, and she'll know that we did the right thing by her and, and, uh, and we were honored to be a part of the story.